Dr. Doug Lucas here, retired orthopedic surgeon now focusing my practice on osteoporosis and bone health. Have you heard of the supplement Ipriflavone? Ipriflavone has been around really since kind of the early 90s and was really popular for a while. I get some questions on it now and then, so I wanted to dive into the research a little bit just to give you guys an understanding of, should this be something that we are really leaning on? Is it part of a more comprehensive program or should we avoid it altogether? So stick around, we'll find out. So first off, we have to understand what is Ipriflavone. So Ipriflavone is a synthetic isoflavone that has been studied pretty extensively, as it turns out, for osteoporosis, mostly in the 90s. Now, you might be asking yourself what an isoflavone is. And an isoflavone is basically a type of a phytoestrogen, which is a synthetic form of an estrogen. Um, all of these things are subclasses of flavonoids, which essentially are these same things as polyphenols. And you may have heard all of these names being thrown around. Um, and polyphenols are known as compounds that have antioxidant activity. So right there, you can already sense a couple of ways that ipriflavone may impact bone health, but there really is about five things that we can point to as to why this thing may impact bone health. So whenever I'm wondering if something is a good tool to use for osteoporosis, I always want to try to understand the mechanism. And since I just said that this is a phytoestrogen, it does have some estrogenic properties. It seems to be very mild, but we know that estrogen will decrease osteoclast function, the cells that break down bone. So it could potentially slow down bone loss. So that could be a good thing. So the second thing that I just mentioned is that this fits into a class of antioxidant molecules. And antioxidants can have an impact on bone health in theory, although it's kind of hard to prove because it's such a broad system. But we know that excess oxidation can be a result of an inflammatory process, can be a result of a lot of things. Um, but antioxidants seem to be generally positive towards bone health. This might be another mechanism then that ipriflavone could play a role in bone health. Now, the next three are all kind of theories. So there is a theory that uh, ipriflavone can actually cause this cell process called apoptosis. Now, apoptosis is a fancy word for programmed cell death. And we want cells that are on their way out, that are at the end of their life cycle, to go through this process versus becoming something like a senescent cell. That's kind of an anti-aging concept. But this specific theory is that ipriflavone will encourage osteoclasts, again, the cells that break down bone, to go through apoptosis, which again could be another way that it slows down bone loss. Okay, and then lastly, based off of the research, it also seems like ipriflavone slows down osteoclasts in general, whether it be from those mechanisms I just described or not, and it actually encourages bone growth and osteoblast function. And so there's five different ways that potentially ipriflavone could have an impact, although three of those are not really very clear. We don't have a mechanism for it, but at least we have an understanding of why this thing may work the way that it's supposed to. The question is, what does the research show? Okay, so this is a supplement that actually has a tremendous amount of research behind it. So this tells me that this was sort of being vetted for a pharmaceutical probably, since it is synthetic, it could be patented, and it, it showed some promise. And so there were some really good studies done. So we actually have a 2020 meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis, if you're not familiar, is a, a research attempt to gather all the information from a specific type of study. In this case, this is a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. So well-designed trials that had both an intervention group with ipriflavone and a placebo group. So there were 11 studies that were included in this meta-analysis and they were able to put all of the data into one place and come up with a conclusion. So what was that result? Well, with over 1,600 people included in all these RCTs, there was a subtle increase on average of bone mineral density in the spine. Unfortunately, none of these studies looked at things like fracture risk, and they only seemed to look at spine overall because there wasn't enough data to compare anything else like femoral neck. So it does give us some information. They also added up all of the potential risks uh, associated with it and there did appear to be some signal around some uh, gastrointestinal side effects but other than that there did not appear to be a consistent risk uh, over time with the dose uh, and the dosing was pretty consistent at 200 milligrams three times a day so 600 milligrams per day 
So sometimes that's all you need to make a decision around a product, but because the effect was so minimal, I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper and we did pull up a couple of studies and one of them I have listed here was a little concerning for me because it was a very well designed study, four centers, four different countries, um, and it showed a pretty significant increase in the risk of what's called lymphocytopenia, which is a change of white blood cell um, quantities in the blood. And uh, it did resolve over time, but it was really consistent. And so I can't really explain that. And it wasn't consistent in all the other studies, but it was a little bit concerning. And then also we saw consistently over the other studies that we looked at that there were some, some GI side effects. There were also some other interesting studies that popped up when we researched this on other things that antioxidants potentially could be good for, like reducing inflammation, attempts at managing cancer naturally, et cetera. So it looks like Ipriflavone does potentially have some therapeutic use, but it all seems to be relatively mild. So do we love it? Should this be the thing that we go to? I think that the, the effect is not big enough for us to lean on this as a very powerful tool. It seems like it could be part of a comprehensive program. The question is, and this is where I see a lot of people struggle, which is, what are the foundational things that you need to put into place? So are you deficient in things like magnesium, vitamin D, your B vitamins? Are you getting enough omega-3s? These things that we know have a very profound impact on your bone. And when you start adding up all the things you potentially need to do to your diet, to your movement, from a supplement perspective, do you have room left in your foundation for something that doesn't have a very significant impact. And I think, you know, probably watching the market share drop, if you could measure it, I would say that over the last kind of decade to two decades, the, the number of people using this has probably gone down. It's still out there. It's still commercially available. We have used it in the past and I have seen people have gastrointestinal side effects from the products that we were using. Um, so maybe that's why. The other thing that bothers me about this is that I still don't really understand the mechanism. You know, is it because of the subtle phytoestrogen? Is it because of the antioxidant properties? I kind of like to know a little bit better why things work um, if we're gonna use them on our patients. So I think it's okay. I don't think it's wrong. I think it's part of a, a comprehensive program as long as you are taking care of the foundational stuff and not really leaning on this one thing very heavily. No matter what somebody chooses to do, I think it's really important that they are measuring to make sure that your bone turnover markers are looking better and better over time, your BMD is getting better, and ultimately you wanna look at all the things that will have to do with fracture risk. So if you're leaning on this, make sure that you're testing to make sure that it's doing what you think it's doing. Um, it's just okay. I think that it's a reasonable thing to add into a stack, but it can't be the only thing. Uh, so I hope you found that helpful. Thanks so much for listening. And if you wanna learn more about how we help patients or about our programs, just click this link up here and it'll walk you through the process of what we have to offer. If you wanna learn more about how you could potentially do more on your own at home, look for the link for our masterclass in the description below. The masterclass is some, an opportunity that we give you to learn how we help patients, what you can do on your own, but also to ask questions. Uh, and these Q&A sessions can go for quite some time. So uh, get into that if you can and if you want to. Um, also, we love to hear from you. So we love the comments and questions that we get on YouTube. So look down and leave comments for us. Uh, we'd love to hear more about um, your thoughts, topics that you'd like for us to cover, questions about what we've covered. So please communicate with us through that avenue as well. And lastly, of course, we appreciate it if you like, subscribe, and sign up for notifications. The more people subscribe, the more people are shown this information when they're looking for uh, the topic of bone health and osteoporosis. So if you could do us that favor, we would really appreciate that. It helps us to spread our message and to serve our mission. Thank you so much.